for that welcome. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you in this very interesting, beautiful city with old friends and meeting new friends. And it's also a very great honor great honor to have been asked to participate in this important event celebrating 75 years of organized philately in this region. My only regret is that I don't, don't speak Spanish very well. In fact, I'm quite ignorant. And I admire anybody who is bilingual. But fortunately, the organizers of this event have produced this beautiful book where you can follow along and understand what I'm saying if you don't know English. And when I depart, I'm going to be sticking close to that text, but when I depart from it, Jaime will help with translation. Bien. Eh. A ver, a ver si me escuchan bien. Sí. Bien, entonces para no cruzar cables allá atrás, déjenme entonces a mí hacer el esfuerzo. Si se me acaba la voz me van a perdonar. Eh, nos estaba dando las gracias Nicolás eh, por haberlo invitado a Monterrey, yo creo que debe ser al revés, pero eh, como quiera se las aceptamos con sumo gusto. Con sumo gusto. Y en, el, en esta ocasión... Eh, eh, Vamos, vamos a presentar 50 joyas de la Revolución Mexicana, que no es ninguna exageración cuando viene de Nicolás Jodasby. Nicolás Jodasby, todos ustedes eh, están familiarizados con él, es uno de los conocedores eh, más grandes, si no el número uno de la Revolución Mexicana. Eh, ha tenido la fortuna de ver estas piezas, de haberlas manejado, de haberlas tenido en sus manos y las va a compartir hoy con nosotros ustedes se, van a, se las van a llevar de recuerdo en el libro que estamos dando como, como eh, libro conmemorativo este 75 aniversario de, de Sofía Rey eh, para no alargarnos demasiado en la conferencia de hoy, porque son 50 piezas la conferencia se va a dar en inglés va a tratar de, de apegarse al texto que está en el libro en algunos casos se va, se va a separar tantito y es cuando voy a entrar yo a traducir. Pero en, el, en caso de que ustedes no entiendan inglés y quieran seguir lo que está explicando ni, Nicolás y lo que van a ter, ver, ver ustedes proyectado es ahí está más. Este, en la pantalla pueden ustedes seguir el pie de foto de la ilustración y ahí van a entender lo que Nicolás va a estar leyendo. Most collectors are one of two types. There's the general collector who collects usually in a stamp album and tries to fill as many of the spaces as he can. He'll fill the stamps, the spaces for the revolution, but often not with very much enthusiasm, not really loving those messy overprints and not necessarily feeling very confident that what they're putting in those spaces is genuine. And sadly, uh, there's some good reason for that. The other collectors are the specialists. And for the most part, they tended to be attracted to the classics. I think the common feeling is that the classics are artifacts from a more gracious, more romantic era. And in contrast, the revolution material may seem to them chaotic, plebeian, grubby, born of violence, and of national suffering. The material may be historic, but it is not thought of as beautiful, and certainly not as being classy. And I can see that they are right, but only about average material. If there is a point to my talk tonight, it is to say that uh, certain exceptional items from every era of philately deserve to be considered aristocrats of philately, right along with the classics. And to make that case in the case of the revolution, 
I'm showing tonight what I consider to be among the great gems of that period. In my opinion, as rare, as interesting, as important, or as beautiful as any of the classics. All of the items are ones that I've either owned during my 40-some years of collecting the revolution, or which I've sold during my career as a dealer. Certainly, there are other pieces that are just as fine in other hands, and I know a few people in this room that have some, um, or for which I simply didn't have a scan available. Selecting the items to show wasn't easy. And that's because I chose to limit the number to 50 without over-representing any particular issue or aspect at the expense of the rest. This meant, that, this meant leaving out some covers in the name of balance that might actually be more impressive or rare uh, than some of the ones that I'm showing. And not all of the ones that I'm showing are obvious gems. There are a few that are neither expensive nor rare, but for other reasons, which I'll try to explain when we get to them, I find them extraordinary. That said, I invite you to enjoy the show. The first stamps printed by a revolutionary faction were the typeset issues of Sonora. At first, the sheets of 10 stamps were perforated line by line, and this meant chop, 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 chop. Ocho basis. Uh, this was a very slow process, and they wised up fast and found a more efficient way to add the separations, which was to build a typeset printer's rule um, in a comb shape, and then they could do the sheets ka chunk, ka chunk, or actually ka chunk, turn the sheet in ka, -ch ka chunk, so to speak. Anyway, the ones that were perforated ended up on the bottom of the stack, covered by the ones that were roulette. So the roulette ones were issued first and, uh, in May, mid-May of 1913, and the perforated ones didn't appear until July. Today there are four or five mint examples known, as well as several used ones and a complete sheet with favor cancels, which is now in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., and also about 15 covers. Two of these bear three stamps. This one show, is a triple weight cover, and the three stamps are in an intact strip. This is a very famous cover, and it recently changed hands for, I'll say it in Spanish, Veinte Cinco Mil Dolores. So we're getting up in the stratosphere like some of the classics. Next. The other perforated Sonora cover with three stamps is registered. And this was once the crown jewel of my own collection. All three stamps are watermarked Peerless Mills, which was the Peerless Mills was the paper manufacturing company. And next. This is vastly less expensive, but to my eye, this is perhaps the most beautiful of all the Sonora Blanco covers. As it's a, a once and toggle printed matter, printed on this, or, or used on this very beautiful, elegant uh, printed envelope, and it's in perfect, perfect condition. Um, these printed envelopes are something that the classics don't have. Next. Thank you. Postcards with the Sonora Blancos are rarely encountered. Two centavos was the rate, but the Sonoras weren't recognized abroad. In fact, they weren't recognized outside of the state of Sonora. So this has a US one cent stamp added, and it's somewhat unusual that the stamp is a parcel post issue. This happened, but not very routinely. At this point, I'm going to depart from the text 
um, to make a point that I think is, is rather important. The white stamps have the words Estado Libre y Soberano de Sonora. And I knew what the words meant, but didn't necessarily appreciate the historical significance of this. Um, <coughs> By the terms of the 1857 Constitution, Sonora was one of several states that was designated free and sovereign, which meant that in a national emergency, they were authorized to take over federal functions. And this included the post. In the en la Constitución de 1857, which was vigente in this moment, se contempla en casos de emergencia, las facultades de un Estado libre y soberano, y eso es, y eso es algo que quiso sobrar, sobrayar, está facultado para tomar decisiones administrativas que lo facultan para validar el uso de estos de esta, de timbres y hacerlos genuinos como, como timbres. When the constituyentes um, developed this idea and put it in the Constitution, they had in mind, I think, exactly, given the unsettled circumstances of those times, they had exactly the idea or anticipated the sort of problem that happened in February 1913 with the military coup. Cuando, cuando los legisladores que redactaron la Constitución de 1857 redactaron esos artículos, eh, Eh, Nicolás está seguro que contemplaron la posibilidad de que este escenario se diera algún, algún tipo de emergencia nacional eh, como la que se dio en febrero de 1913. Therefore, this is not a local issue, it is a national issue with the full legal weight of the Constitution behind it. And even though the stamp is primitive looking, they put the words on there to give it the authority. De tal manera que bajo ese criterio, esta estampilla postal no es una estampilla local, es una estampilla nacional emitida por una autoridad competente bajo los criterios establecidos en la Constitución de 1857. No es un provisional, es un tipo de, de, nacional hablando de mí. Okay. Now we go to the next one. Thank you. <laughs> this piece bears two cinco centavos sonoras with double green seal controls. But when I first owned it, the stamp at the left was missing. By incredible luck, I was able to buy the missing stamp. And to this day, these are the only two examples of this error that I have seen aside from several fakes. Okay, next. In late September 1913, after quite a number of these um, green, con green printed control issues had been printed and distributed, a small group of white issue sheets was overprinted with green seal control in a light bluish green shade. These already had the embossed word control, constitucional, as was usual on the white issues. Of these, the two centavos is the rarest, followed by one centavo, five centavos, and less rare, the three centavos, of which there may be 10 to 15 copies known. The sheets of, the ten, sheets of 10 of the two centavos included two with the italic numeral as seen here. Four or five used examples are known, mostly on cover, and some of these are in the Smithsonian Institution, never again to grace a private collection. Same for the only other unused example. This is probably the most valuable and important of the revolutionary issues. And like the perforated three-strip cover, um, it recently sold for about $25,000. Next one. 
This is only slightly, slightly less rare. This is from the same you know, sheet as, as the italic two. This occurred eight times in the sheet, which makes sense. She would ten, two gone, eight, so forth. Next. Once Sonora was controlled by the revolutionaries, aside from the port of Guaymas, mail entering the country through a federally controlled port of entry could not enter the state for delivery. This was sent from Hong Kong, April 23, 1913, to Carlos Sonora, and was hand that received a, an Officina Clausurana hand stamp. Actually, it doesn't quite read. I'll read it out to you. Delta Port Estar, Fasorada, La Oficina de Destino. Thanks. The so-called a hair issue was intended for fiscal use, but while postal stamps were ordered at the same time, their production and delivery was delayed. So the ejército served for postage until the transitorial issue arrived. Here the five centavos letter rate was paid using four ejércitos and one of the new transitorios. Each one centavo, but the ejércitos were now deemed invalid and hit with a very rare new hand stamp. And a penalty due of eight centavos was applied. Only the transitorial was accepted. Strangely, it didn't get canceled. Next. A common five centavos transitorial is tied by an extremely rare military cancel of the División del Centro, com commanded by the constitutionalist General Bonfilo Natera. The other example known of this cancel is off cover. Some otherwise very ordinary covers are great because they got caught up in extraordinary events and bear markings to prove it. This was sent from Mazatlan to a regimental band musician with the federal forces defending the area around Torreon, including Gomez Palacio. The Battle of Torreon was already <coughs> underway when this was sent, and since the federals lost to Villa, the letter could not be delivered and was hand stamped Clausurada Clasura, La Oficina de Destino. It was then sent to the Departamento de Rezagos in Mexico City where the contents were examined to find the name of the sin. And then it was redirected back to Mazatlan, that's what the, the sender's name written in red, where it was listed but not claimed, so it ended up becoming a dead letter. There are about 40 or 50 of these, um, uh, what I call battle covers, uh, Oficina Clausurata covers that got mixed up in a takeover. This was sent from one federal soldier to another, sent from uh, Saltillo in late April 1914 to a soldier at San Luis Potosí. It arrived, but the addressee could not be found, so it was forwarded to, to the Sagos, where the, where the sender's name was gotten from the contents so that it could be redirected back to Saltillo. But by this time, the Battle of Paradon outside of Saltillo had been fought and lost, so the Federals evacuated the city four days later. So this is why Disperso is written across the uh, envelope explaining why it is retired to the dead letter archive. And now, these are both pretty common covers as the constitutionalists overran most of northern Mexico. They could not keep up with the demand for stamps. In time, the five centavos rate for common letters was paid with two centavos three times, or two centavos combined with the four centavos, and then two four centavos, and finally, out of desperation, people were overpaying the five cent rate with 10 centavos stamps. 
Then for several days, they allowed the bisecting of the tens and toggles stamps. The extraordinary thing here is that the covers are from the same correspondence, just a couple of days apart, showing this perfectly, this um, uh, part of the story. The Rosago's hand stamp was intended to direct undeliverable mail to that department, as we've seen earlier up with the two battle covers. But it was used at Santa Ana, Sonora as a cancel after the proper device was lost. This is from a brief period when ten centavos transitorios were all that were available to pay the five centavos rate. So it's a nice cover, two different ways. A philatelist and professional printer, George Lynn, in Columbus, Ohio, undertook to produce a new supply of the five centavos transitorio and sent 75,000 stamps as a sample. Unfortunately for Lynn, this did not lead to the placing of an order. But for the postal officials, the samples came in very handy during the ensuing shortage. Single frankings are not particularly scarce, even though the stamps got used up in just over a week or so. But this registered cover to the U.S. is a gem. On arrival, the only franking recognized was the, the two five centavos centenarios. So postage due was assessed in pencil, and it's the incorrect rate of 12 centavos. And probably should have been just 10 centavos, either that or 20 centavos, depending on the, how it was weighted. Next. The successor to the transitorio, whose arrival alleviated the shortage, was the so-called Denver issue, named for where it was produced. This one is tied by a rare ship cancel of the West Coast steamer Corrigan Tres. Emiliano Zapata controlled the countryside in the states of Morelos and northern Guerrero at the time this was sent from Tedecala to an hacienda no longer accessible to federal mail delivery. The cover from the Rosados file bears the rare bilingual interrupted communications <coughs> box. Okay. Here's another federal casualty from the Dead Letter Archive actually killed twice by Zapata, sent from Plafla on the 1st of April of 1914 to San Buenaventura. It could not be delivered because of the interrupted communications. Then it couldn't be returned to Plafla because in the meantime, Zapata had taken, taken the place over. Some covers are important because of the rarity of the stamps or the unusual rate or the handling and its postal historical significance. But to me, a cover may also be very special for aesthetic reasons alone. I see some of these covers as being evidence of an intuitive artistry that seems to be more prevalent in Mexico than in a lot of other places. <clears throat> Here, the extremely common five centavos 1910 is tied by a fairly scarce provisional cancel of Acapaneda. But the really great thing is the color coordination. Is this art or is this accident? Either way, I think Seam Rival is a very good name for this cover. <laughs> In all the chaos, it's not surprising that canceling devices disappeared, so that markings intended for other purposes were applied as cancels in the emergency. Here's a great strike of the fancy administrator's seal of Paras. The administrator's seal of Reynosa, Tamaulipas, ties at once in Tom of Denver on a printed matter cover. This little fellow is my idea of philatelic perfection.
Here's the administrator seal of Noria de Angeles in Zacatecas. To me, this rivals any of the 19th century cancels in beauty. And the rarity of these provisional cancels is such that most are known from only one or two examples. Many were in use for only a few weeks at a time when communications were greatly disrupted. There are about 10 examples known of the military cancel of the Brigada Robles, which was a key element of Villa's División del Norte. Most are poorly struck. They do, do not come better than this one. Okay. The blue oval is the unique example of the traveling military post office of, of General Francisco Villa's headquarters. In the summer and fall of 1914 and into 1915, captured stocks of federal stamps, usually the 1910 issue, were overprinted locally by the Constitutionalists. The first to appear, and also the most common, is that of Monterey. But for some reason, Monterey provisional covers are usually not very attractive. The envelope, envelope papers of poor quality and the Covers are otherwise messy and they tend to be falling, flaking apart, literally. This one is a gorgeous example, and all the more notable for originating from Swaspa, where an antique canceling device from the mid 1890s was being used. The EC Constitucionalista overprint of Colima is scarce, but not rare. But here's a cover to Honolulu, which is certainly an exotic destination. It reached Hawaii, but could only be delivered or returned, so it ended, couldn't be delivered or returned, so it ended up in the dead letter files in Mexico City. So it has the gray Rosado seal that we've seen on a number of other covers. Even off cover, the 20 centavos with Baja California's overprint is close to unique. At least it is when it's genuine. The cover is outstanding in every way. Probably the finest Baja California provisional overprint cover is this registered one with the unique 10 centavos used block of four. to own it, I cry in the seal almost. Here's a great registered cover with a three strip of 20 centavos of the Sonora Coach Seal issue overprinted EC, a Hercito in Campania on campaign, which is the uh, Limus, Limus overprint. This was carried by coastal, coastal steamer Solano to San Francisco. So they typed the instruction of what ship should carry it. Okay. The local overprint is that of Oaxaca, which is uncommon whether on or off cover. Perhaps five covers are known, of which I believe this is the finest. The overprint on this is in a very faint bluish green sort of the same color as, as that of the registration box. And this is the overprint of Salamanca. This is the only registered Salamanca provisional cover known to me, and it is certainly one of the most beautiful of, of the local overprint covers. A three centavos with the local overprint of Ciudad Gonzalez pays a single weight just single weight discount letter rate for official mail. This cover, thus franked, is probably unique. There are perhaps a dozen in Ciudad Gonzalez provisional overprint covers known. Uh, several other ones are official, but they are multiples of the single weight. 
So it had been like six centavos or nine centavos, 12 centavos. This is the only single franchise. At least I think it is. The three line overprints are from Sombrerete. This was one of the rarest of the local overprints. The red overprints on the stamps are Hidalgo de Peral. They look a lot like Monterey, but are smaller. Only about five covers of these are known. The letter card also bears the so-called Chihuahua overprint, which was widely used in Chihuahua, but also in parts of Durango and Coahuila. And uh, in this case, it's on there because it's postal stationary. Uh, only about five or six stamps are known with the Las Esperanzas overprint. Centavo with the dollar sign overprint is nothing special. It is tied to what may be one be the, the most historically important of all revolutionary covers. When B and Carranza were on the verge of going to war with one another and splitting the recently victorious revolutionary movement, a convention of military leaders was convened in Mexico City, October 1st, 1914 to try and avert the catastrophe. On October 9th, it was decided to move the convention to a more neutral location, and they selected Aguas Calientes. Circulars announcing the change of venue were sent out to various generals, including Emiliano Zapata. Zapata and Cuernavaca had not attended the convention, but members were anxious that he be included. The problem, as we see from this cover addressed to him, is that mail wasn't, was not being conveyed into the territory he controlled. So his circular ended up in the dead letters archive, which later came into philatelic hands, and finally into my hands. Uh, to briefly finish the story on the other one, but we don't need to go back. Um, Zapata finally did send delegates to Los Calientes after a group headed by uh, General Felipe Angeles traveled to Cuernavaca and personally invited Zapata. But in the end, the convention failed to save the country from a new round of civil war. Now we're to this one. One of the flashpoints in the controversy was Sonora, where the governor, Jose Maria Maitorena, was opposed by Carranza and supported by Villa. Under Maitorena, Sonora once more issued stamps, including this 10 centavos coach seal issue from the somewhat scarce first printing. What makes this cover special is it is addressed to the governor who caused the stamp to be issued, Maitorena. After the failure of the convention, Carranza was forced to evacuate Mexico City, which was then occupied by an interim president named by the con convention and backed by Villa. That was Eulalio Gutierrez. Two monogram overprints with the letters GCM were produced, the taller one now known as the Villa monogram. This cover with two five centavos with Bia monogram was sent by Bia himself to one of his lady friends. See what it says? Ejercito del Norte, General and Jefe. This is probably the most beautiful of the Bia monogram covers and also one of the rarest as it bears one of the very few known legitimately issued 20 centavos of 1899 with the overprint. The Constitutionalists doubled their rates in February of 1915, and the new rate for a local letter doubled to four centavos. 
This is a double, this is double weight, and the 20 centavos is for registration. <laughs> this is one of the more valuable covers in the presentation. During the few months in which Mexico City was abandoned to Zapata, stamps for overprinting were in short supply. Many stamps were removed from booklets, and the panes of eight were overprinted using a small press with a plate of eight subjects. Other stamps were similarly overprinted eight at a time, including a few of the 50 centavos of 1899 or 19.3 issues with the BM monogram for uh, e e any of these, well, excuse me, I missed a line. Other stamps were similarly overprinted. Here is a reconstruct reconstruction of su such a sheet using two blocks of four. Any of the 1899 or 19.03 issues with BM monogram brands from this period are very rare. Most of the few others were made by Costa Hinojosa later to sell to collectors. So, but the ones from uh, the Zapata period are oral. Here's a similar 15 Centavos 1899, part of the franking on a registered cover addressed to the well-known photographer Charles B. Waite. The same the same has been found on second-class mailing receipts from periodicals, but this, as far as I know, is the only cover. Interesting, it has both the Carranza and the Bia monogram. Actually, the Carranza monogram was named Carranza because it was adopted by Carranza after this period, but it was actually certain values were produced at the same time as the B of my brand. So it only became Carranza's later. It's not, a, it's not a mixed regime franking or anything like that. Okay. This large registered cover with a visa de recibo request is franked with a 50 centavos of, 18, uh, of 1903 with the BIA issued legitimately during the Zapata occupation in Mexico City. The cover has been cleaned and reinforced, but is unique. I know of one other used copy of the stamp and a few mint ones. The cursive GCM monogram overprint was first produced and used right alongside the tall Bia, as I explained earlier. Later, it was adopted by Carranza and is called the Carranza monogram. Most double overprints were produced for philatelic sale, but this 10 centavos was regularly issued and used. I believe it's a unique cover. Probably a unique example of this stamp in a non philatelic printing. Oaxaca tried to remain neutral and remote from the battles raging between Villa and Carranza, but Carranza would have none of it. Much of the state was put under siege. As the Oaxacans began running out of stamps, they produced their own. Here, local postage is paid with two one centavo Oaxaca provisionals and registration with dollar sign overprint stamps. Here again, Oaxaca was another one of the uh, Libre y Soberano Estadios, so that appears on their stamp also. So they're invoking the authority of the 1857 Constitution. Certainly the most beautiful Oaxaca provisional cover is this one registered from Etla in February 1916, right before the end. Four genuine covers are known, franked with ten centavos. Whoever made this cover had great artistic instincts, particularly in terms of color and overall neatness. Whether they also had an interest in philately is not known. In any case, it's one of my favorites.
some of my gems are worth next to nothing. Uh, this is a common franking from um, November 1916 during the inflation. Um, there must be at least 50 or 100 of these covers floating around somewhere. But here again, the beauty is aesthetic. Look at the color coordination, the, the, the brown and gray-black of the stamp, the brown and gray-black of the printed envelope. For me, it's just a, a, a wonderful thing of beauty, a minor masterpiece, so to speak. On November 21st, the letter rate was raised to two and a half pesos. This cover is far more impressive if you see both the front and the back. So let's go ahead and look at the back, uh, Fernando. Altogether, it bears 125 centavos stamps, 25 pesos. The registration fee is 5 pesos, and the rest paid quadruple what rate to the U.S. As far as I know, this is the highest known franking on a revolutionary cover. The revolution didn't end in 1917. Um, it rattled along until actually 1940 they were still having problems or the threat of problems. But the most serious of these was in 1923, Adolfo de la Huerta, who had been governor of Sonora, then interim president in 1920, and a cabinet member thereafter, raised a major revolt after President Obregón handpicked his successor, the less popular Tutarco Elias Calles. This betrayal of democracy, at least it was a betrayal of democracy in, in De La Huerta's eyes, led to widespread support of the revolt. But by the time stamps were ordered by, the De, La, by De La Huerta, <clears throat> the revolt controlled only Oaxaca, Campeche, and Frontera in, in Tabasco. So they saw very little use, even though they were printed in huge quantities to be used throughout the entire republic. Only a few thousand pieces of mail were sent, while the rest of the stamps were destroyed after the revolt was crushed. Only about 200 covers are now known, of which only a couple or three were sent outside of the Yucatan Campeche area. This one to New Orleans, the previous one. You know, let's stay with that one a minute. I like that one. Okay. After an initial 15 centavos letter rate, postage was raised to 20 centavos. He paid at Campeche with two 10 centavos, De La Huertistas. It was certain all remaining stamps were burned, including all of the 50 centavos value, until a small group was found in the bottom of the drawer at the Merida Post Office in 1927. All 50 centavos mint stamps come from two sheets, each of, each of, of 200 stamps, actually double panes with a gutter. One was perforated and the other was imperforate from this find. A Spaniard named Somorostro bought all of them. He was apparently a stamp dealer of sorts, but his activity probably ended after he moved back to Spain, taking some blocks of De La Hurtista stamps with him. Miraculously, after 92 years, this great block of 45 perforated 50 centavos remains intact. I sold it a few years ago, and I made the uh, buyer swear he'd never take it apart. <laughs> I hope you've been entertained by these 50 gems, and that this presentation has inspired greater appreciation of the revolution. And, and um, 
and that you see that the revolution added richly to our wonderful fellow toy hobby here in Mexico. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, Jaime and I will work together to try and answer them. para nosotros un gran logro y la mejor manera de celebrar 75 años el poder entregar a ustedes en este libro joyas filatélicas del siglo XIX y del siglo XX gracias Eladio gracias Nicolás eh, dejamos, dejamos este libro como constancia de que en el año 2016 hubo un club en Monterrey preocupado por la filatelia preocupado por preservar nuestro acervo y queriéndolo compartir con ustedes. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, con esto terminamos nuestro ciclo de conferencias, agradeceremos a los que se quieran quedar a acompañarnos a cenar y pues, nos vemos en algunos años, estaremos este, celebrando otro aniversario. Fernando, no sé si quieras agregar. Bueno, yo nada más a nombre de la Sociedad Filatélica Regín Montana, y realmente queremos agradecer a todos su presencia, que, hayan, que nos hayan acompañado en esta celebración, y eh, realmente esperamos que vengan pasado bien aquí en la ciudad, y los esperamos en el futuro. Muchas gracias. How did you find the, the missing stamp in the in the in the piece that you that you show you? The third or fourth piece. How did you find the missing stamp? Hay una imagen que, que, que reconstruyó el sobre porque afortunadamente encontró el timbre que se había separado de la cubierta y lo volvió a unir. Está preguntando Eugenio la historia de dónde encontró ese timbre. Actually, um, the value of the stamp made that easy because it turned up in an auction catalog. If I had been trying to find a cheaper stamp, I'd probably still be missing it. La encontró en un catálogo, en un catálogo de venta y la identificó inmediatamente. Sí. 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 Decirte, realmente estamos agradecidos por el periodo que estuviste administrando este documento. Igual que a nuestro compañero, que es el nuevo presidente, David. David. A Carlos. Gracias. Y decirte a ti, gracias por los 100 años que donaste, por el honor, por el mes, a todos, a todos los miembros de estas sociedades filatéricas afiliadas a Comunidad. Y decirte también a Sofi Rey, gracias por la invitación, gracias por darnos estas alegrías, muchas gracias. gracias.